right now, today, unnecessarily complicating a simple task sounds like fun. I plan to use some of the latest, most sophisticated science and technology I have at my disposal to solve a problem. A problem that in all likelihood only I have. Wide audience appeal? That's my middle name. I'm going to, or want to anyway, build a fixture to restore, sharpen, the cutting edge of my pruners to factory edge. We're not talking just sharp here. Factory sharp. I don't know why adding factory made those last statements sound so much more impressive. Factory. Truth be damned, I mean told, these are pretty sharp as they are. I do keep my pruners sharp. As most normal people do, you'd sharpen these by hand, freehand. As part of my field kit, I usually keep a little sharpening stone with me. By field kit, I mean a plastic bag full of junk. A 180 or so stone, this happens to be 150, does the trick just fine. So then if a small stone is all you need, what's all the hubbub? Well, I appreciate you asking. Allow me to explain. This is a curved edge, and freehand sharpening a curved edge can sometimes be complicated. Over time, unless you're a robot, as you sharpen, it's exceedingly likely that you'll change that shape. Out of the box, they're at some nice consistent angle. A nice clean bevel, stem to stern. Eventually, that bevel will likely be all over the place. If you don't believe me, pause the video and go have a look at those loppers you have hanging in the garage. Okay, so over time, you're changing the shape of the blade. Is that the problem then? No, absolutely not. Will it still be sharp? Yeah, it probably will. Does it still bother me? Well, you can bet your ass, okay, fine. Maybe it doesn't really bother me. And I don't want to come across as that guy that likes to sit in a stained tank top talking to myself with Wheel of Fortune in the background, sharpening a knife at the kitchen table. Or do I? I think this could be a fun project. You might recall I'm the guy who bought a chainsaw grinder even though a file has worked fine for me since forever. So reasons be danged, I'm gonna try it. Side note, all you kind viewers out there that leave me nice comments about being inspired to or wanting to get into machining, well, welcome to a brief glimpse at your future. Today we'll be talking about Falco number eights because I have three of them. Two of which I'm starting to think are knockoffs. This one and the one I've taken apart. I'm not 100% sure, but I got this Edgar Allan Poe telltale heart thing going on when I look at these. If they are knockoffs, there's someone out there doing one heck of a good job. Knocked these right out of the well-pruned park they did. In fact, in using them interchangeably, I never even had any doubts until today when I started to take this one apart. I've noticed that these two on the right both use round head screws. And according to legend anyway, not to mention Falco's website, they've only ever used hex head screws. These weird like slotted hex head screws. Also, if you look really close, squint your eyes a little, the aluminum casting on the handles has a different aura, maybe. I don't know how to explain it, but everything else seems to be spot on. The dip coating is perfect, very well attached. The locking mechanism is identical. The way the blades are mounted all seems identical. The stamping is a little different, but the back of the knockoff blade where once mounted you could never see is stamped Felco. Seems like a lot of trouble to go to. I don't know, maybe they copy everything else and buy the original blades. This one, the one I know is authentic, I've sharpened quite a few times and I can't trust that this edge is original. Pretty positive it's not, but the one I've taken apart and it's buddy here, I took right out of the packaging, which looked perfect by the way. These were eBay, secondhand, got both of these for the price of one, maybe should have been my tip off, and you can tell these were slightly used and probably hung in a humid garage. Just some general tarnish, but otherwise, brand new. In fact, you can still sort of see the grind marks on this bevel. All that to say, I think this will be my benchmark for making the jig. I don't know what the bevel angle is supposed to be, so I'm going to copy this one. A little bit of a gamble, sure, but dang, this sure seems legit to me. 
best I can tell, Felco doesn't really advertise what that factory bevel angle is. Best I can measure is 22 and a half degrees. And even that's a bit of a guess. Though the OEM recommends you sharpen at 23 degrees, which sort of adds up, par for the course. They're not asking you to remove material from the entire bevel, just the leading business end. And that extra half a degree would do that. But how a person would hold a consistent 23 degree angle on a curved cutting tool is a whole nother story. Maybe not an important story, sure, but another story nonetheless. For my jig, I'll start at 22 and a half degrees. We'll test the jig against these bevels. We'll use some Sharpie, see how close we get. But as in most things, consistency front to back is probably more important than whatever the actual angle is anyway. When making a jig like this, it's often helpful to know how these were originally manufactured. I don't know if that's actually true, but it sounds pretty legit, doesn't it? I don't know how these are originally manufactured. My guess is probably some sort of cam-driven grinder from the 1900s that follows the, what would you call that, teardrop shape maybe? That teardrop shaped blade profile? Maybe there's 20 of these loaded at a time and the machine goes all motion of the ocean against an array of grinding wheels. In situations like this, as Benjamin Franklin once wisely suggested, try poking around on YouTube. Of course, old Ben was right, and I found some videos from Felco. Unfortunately, their quick montage type videos don't exactly show the entire process start to finish, but I did find two things. First, it appears they grind the bevels with a robot. Here it's shown doing the back bevel, but it's probably safe to assume it does the primary bevel too. It looks like the robot is doing the five degree back bevel on the bottom, and I bet it does the primary bevel on the top of that grinder belt. Second, and very exciting in a sad sort of way, I may have inadvertently stumbled across my soulmate. <gasps> Unfortunately, and not unexpected I suppose, he's already spoken for. Discovering that these are CNC ground with a robot was a bit of a letdown, or a bad omen. A robot, of course, can grind any bevel shape it's programmed to, and doesn't really bode well for making my own simple jig. Needless to say, but I'll say it anyway, I was bummed. And for a while, too. I was just going to have to keep sharpening my pruners by hand. Laying awake at night, staring at the ceiling, I entertained all sorts of silly ideas like programming the CNC milling machine and trying to run a small stone in the machine spindle. But I don't have the spindle speeds for that. And even if I did, small stones would be a nightmare. But I could CNC a cam shape of some kind, some larger shape that this blade mounts to, and maybe use that up against the stop of a bench grinder. Glimmer of hope. Fueled by that rush of adrenaline only a dumb solution could give a person, I sat down and I put the pruning blade in CAD. Usual method, I took a good clean photo and then scaled that to match the dimensions I could measure precisely, like the holes and the rounds, the overall length, that sort of thing. Once scaled, I could carefully trace the blade shape, and joy of joys, do you know what I discovered? As close as I can measure, it looks like the profile of this blade is circular. It's a freaking circular arc, it's not a teardrop at all. It's an arc with a 2.16 inch radius, or as the Swiss probably call it, 55 millimeters. And in machining, circles are pretty easy. Circles are exciting. So come on folks, pick your mugs up off the floor and climb back up into the crazy saddle. We've got a jig to make. Judging by your posture and that dead look in your eyes, you're thinking about one of two things. First, was it in fact coal directly responsible for the deadly viral outbreak in the 12 monkeys? And or why this blade profile being circular is such a big deal? To answer your second question and only partially address the first, I'm going to build a very simple jig using just some cardboard or cardstock. We now know from the CAD that this belly has a clean radius of 55 millimeters. That means it's part of a circle with a 110 millimeter diameter. Simply divide 110 by two and voila, we can set our calipers to 55 millimeters. So we don't actually need this whole circle. This stuff is terrible to cut. Use some double-sided tape. It's a little overkill, but it's all I got on hand. I do my best to try to match the scribe line I did with the compass. 
in the hole on the bevel side, I'm just going to install a screw that I can adjust. Just a nut on each side with some washers to keep from crushing the fiberboard, cardstock, whatever. And in this case, I want to adjust the height of this, of that dimension, off the cardboard. So it's 815 thou plus the thickness of that tape. In my case, I think that's 50 thou. So this total height should be 865 thou you know, give or take. To figure that out, we've got a triangle going on here where we know a couple of things. The distance from that blade bevel to that pivot point is 55 millimeters. And this angle, we want to be 22 and a half degrees. Using some high school trigonometry, we can figure out that this height off the back of the blade is 815 thou, plus that offset we put in because of the thickness of the tape. That, or you can do what I did and just measure it in the CAD. I expect some error because this isn't coming to a point. But come on, I cut this freaking thing out of cardboard for crying out. I'm just gonna blue this back edge so we can keep track of what's going on. And now if all went well, I can't really see what I'm doing here. And it's maybe hard for you to see, but that pivot is a little too tall. We're just scratching the blue off the top edge of the bevel. I'll need to lower the screw just a smidge. I've had to tweak this a couple of times now, but I think I should be close. It's a little awkward because, again, I can't see what I'm doing under there. And there it goes. We've picked up the bevel. This sort of shows we're onto something. I mean, technically, we haven't verified that 22 and a half degree angle. The blade's probably not stuck on there perfect. We adjusted the screw a couple of times, but I'm starting to feel good about this. Oh. I danced a little jig. I 3D printed a little jig. It's the same exact thing we just made with the cardboard, except there's no cardboard involved and no tape and no nothing. So in theory anyway, these should be the same exact angles from CAD. All right, we're just using one screw. So there's a shoulder that Blake can sort of register against. Here's our 55 millimeter radius. And that center post now has, well, a little bit more of a divot to it. So we should be a little truer to the center of rotation. I can sort of see how the oil is being pushed around that. We're pretty darn close. All right, I think we did it. Nice. Now do you get why it was in fact Cole's actions that led to the viral outbreak? And more importantly, why a circular profile greatly simplifies this sharpening jig? Come to think of it, should we call Falco and let them know they might not need that multi-million dollar robot cell? It seems so obvious now that the blade shape is round. I can't unsee it. I don't know why I was so hung up on it being some weird, non-easy shape. Maybe because of this scalloped relief grind or the shape of the spine? I don't know. I feel silly now. But feeling silly's never stopped me before, so let's keep on trucking. I'm going to build a cradle for this blade, very much like the 3D printed one out of aluminum. So I have some way to hold onto it and set the radius. I plan to use this on an angle plate on the surface grinder, but one step at a time. For now, I need to cut a small chunk out of this aluminum plate. After that last video, cutting that tool steel to make the toe clamps, I have no more teeth left on my bandsaws. So I'm going to have to cut this plate the old-fashioned way, like our forefathers used to do. <sighs> I've just stretched this plate, made it longer, effectively increasing its volume. And since I'm currently not running my lathe, the pressure in my garage is constant. That means that the temperature of the plate has to drop. It's plummeting. The trick is to stretch it enough to get that rapid temperature drop. Typically, aluminum doesn't become brittle at low temperatures. Well, not like steel does anyway. But this happens to be 51 grade aluminum from New Mexico.
Captain's log, stardate 2023. The blue tape did not take kindly to being bathed in WD-40. Well, didn't this little project escalate quickly? Parts are done. I think they're done anyway. There's the support. I just cleaned it up a bit with some Scotch-Brite, a little bit of deburring, a couple of threaded holes. Same exact geometry as the 3D print. Only difference, this held the blade upside down and this holds it right side up. Only because on my grinder, the table is on the bottom and the grinding wheel is on the top. Maybe your grinder is different. Single screw holds the blade in place. This would have been an excellent use of a left-handed screw. A left-handed screw would drive the blade up against the hard stop, and a right-hand screw is going to try to turn it away. But I'm hoping this washer sorts it out. The blade is referencing only against this back straight edge. There's clearance cut into this curved part because I don't know exactly what the shape of this OEM blade is. And this is a nice, clean, straight, measurable surface. The entire fixture is going to be held down and rotate around this bushing. It's just a smidge thicker than the aluminum plate. So I can tighten the screw and this could still swivel. Lastly, I just popped a small threaded hole in the side. This long screw hopefully will serve as a handle. And there it is. This should make more sense once we're at the grinder. Speaking of which, while I was teleporting my way over here, waiting for my molecules to reassemble, I don't know why it always has to take so long. I realized I referred to my sign plate as an angle plate. I said I'd use an angle plate on the surface grinder when in fact I'm using a sign plate. I sincerely hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. Although technically this isn't not an angle plate, if your angle plate is a sign plate, you call it a sign plate. Think of it like driving a Jeep. Still technically a car, but no one who drives a Jeep refers to it as their car. It's their Jeep. As in, I left my phone in the Jeep. Going to go gas up the Jeep. My Jeep got stuck climbing that 3% grade. An angle plate typically is a fixed angle, usually 90 degrees. To further confuse the matter, adjustable angle plates are also a thing. But sign plates are special. You can identify a sign plate, or a sign bar, or a sign table by these two precision rolls or pins on the bottom. Now how well you can see those. That one and that one back there. The mag chuck is half on and tough to move around. These pins are the same size and a very precise distance apart. In this case, five inches. Center to center, these two pins are five inches apart. So instead of relying on a printed protractor of some kind, we can come back to that trigacalconometry from before. Not super smart dragging stuff around on a partially magnetized chuck. To set this up as a triangle with a 22 and a half degree angle between these two surfaces, and knowing that the rolls are five inches apart, we need to raise this side 1.913417 inches or 48.6 millimeters. Typically, you'd build up that precise stack up, that precise dimension, by packing gauge blocks under this pin. But, so as to not come across as an unapproachable hobby YouTube machinist, I'm going to use a screw jack instead. Maybe not as precise, but should do the trick here, and probably makes the point more clearly to someone seeing this for the first time. And by this, I mean sharpening hand pruners on a surface grinder. So I'm going to set this to one point, might even in frame, I can adjust this, it's a screw jack. I'm going to turn it till I'm at 1.913.
or thereabouts. Once I've got this dimension, I can pack it under this side of the sign table and lock the table down. Let's do a quick check. This should be zero. I'll zero it out there. And this, if all went well, look at that. 22 and a half degrees, and eh, maybe right on the money. I still don't know if that's the right angle. But now I can mount my jig into one of these holes, clamp that bushing down, and hopefully grind a clean radius. I've removed the wheel guard. Hopefully you can see a little bit better. That's never really a smart move. If anyone watching is keeping a list of famous last words, that's probably a good one to add. Quick recap of a couple of things you may have missed when you took your bathroom break. I've had to move the wheel back behind the pivot. It would have been nice to keep everything in line so I'm grinding on a true radius. If I'm on the pivot, I think I would get my true bevel radius or my true bevel angle. But as it turns out, I'd foul the spine of this blade because of the way the relief is ground. That relief angle doesn't point straight back to the pivot. Now, if I put a grind mark through that, would that be the end of the world? Eh, probably. So I'm going to offset the grind. I don't have the mental capacity right now to decide what effect that has on my bevel. It'll still be the correct radius, but I bet my bevel angle changes a bit. And it looks like I might end up with a bit more of a hollower ground than I thought. I've also added a stop in the back. A little countersink screw worked out pretty good. And that stops the jig rotation before I can grind into parts of the blade I don't want to grind. I think that's about all of it. Nothing left to do but try this out. I'm a little nervous here. It's going to be very easy to scrap this part. Do you have any idea how much an OEM replacement blade is for a Felco number no. 8? Trying to sneak up on it as slow as I can. So I'm not hitting that sharpie like I expected. I may not be directly on the center line of this wheel. Who else was sweating bullets? Raise your hand. I like how that looks. Though according to the Sharpie, we did change that angle a bit. I think it was the wheel center line, but it may have been that pivot offset. At any rate, I want to get the wire burr off the back of this thing. That's a serious burr. Arguably, that might be a little too sharp for pruning shears. I'm looking forward to trying these. Nice. They did not do that before. Let me grab the other pair. I'm sorry I didn't film these before, but they behaved exactly the same. Here's some apple. It's green. But man, cuts like butter. This is some 3 8 stainless. Uh, I'm not even going to bother. I'm sure it would be effortless. But hey, if you enjoyed following along and you think you'd like to build a jig like this for yourself, let me know down in the comments. I'm thinking of starting a GoFundMe so we could all chip in and get us some really good group therapy. As always, thanks for sticking around and thanks for watching.